Good afternoon. We welcome you to this first uh, webinar uh, organized by the Museum and Site of Memory. On this occasion, we'll talk about uh, laws and knowing how societies deal with uh, these issues to reflect uh, the relationship between law and memory. We will be having a discussion. We're talking about societies and how they deal with their traumatic uh, past and the experiences that the countries have had. And above all, we, are, we will be having experts uh, on this panel. In Argentina, there is a discussion underway ab about whether the right is connected to this collective memory. In Argentina, uh, this uh, is a threat to undermine uh, rights. And in addition, so we will be discussing the background of these issues in different countries, in Germany, in our country. And we're talking about memory consequences and restrictions to the freedom of expression. A, a brief, uh, some brief comments about institutions that uh, invited to this activity. The museum and site of ESMA, is a center of uh, arrest and extermination, and it is evidence of uh, the state terrorism in cases of crimes against humanity in Argentina. Its role is to contribute to know and to live and understand the violations of human rights perpetrated in Argentina The, this uh, museum uh, is, is a notable place. Then we have uh, Elizabeth Kasman Foundation for critical discussion on the on the past and its consequences for the social groups in our, uh, Latin America, Spain, and Germany. Uh, it supports intercultural dialogue in Latin America. And third, we have Global Diplomacy, it's a platform of new ways of diplomacy that go beyond the traditional policies. Therefore, different uh, professionals want to explore new uh, communication tools. And we also want to think ab about how to think, uh, consider collective uh, initiatives. Then we have uh, uh, Miriam Valencia, she's a, and she's a member of uh, an institution and she has participated in, in the Museum of ESMA. Thank you very much, Salome. Good afternoon, God, good morning, whatever you are. We are very happy to welcome you all to this uh, seminar. We have four experts that will be speaking in this uh, talk from uh, Germany, uh, Holland, uh, Hague, and Argentina. We have Dr. Julia Genaus, Ricardo Izquierdo, Andrea Pozak, and Dr. Dr. Alejandro Alangia, Alasia, who I will be introducing soon. Before starting, I would well like to let you know that you can send your questions and remarks through the YouTube chat. So um, our panelists will be sharing their views and you can write your questions in the chat and then we will be reading those questions so we can start this dialogue where the audience is included. 
So please write these questions uh, as you think about them. We will be first hearing from Dr. Julia Janaus. She's a teacher at the Hamburg University and Criminal Law University at the Atrina University. She has written her doctoral thesis about the prosecution of crimes in international law in Germany, above all the universal principles. She has research and teaching uh, interests, and that includes the transnational international law. We will be hearing from Dr. Julia. Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian. And uh, thank you to the organizers for, for inviting me to this very uh, interesting event. So I was asked to say a few words about the legal situation in, in Germany regarding the uh, criminalization of the phenomenon of uh, denialism. And um, maybe you can share the screen and, and show the, the provision um, I submitted um, because, um, uh, so now you can see the, the one relevant provision uh, from the German criminal code uh, on the screen, which is uh, section 130 paragraph uh, three. There are, however, a number of other provisions in the criminal code that could, of course, depending on the, on the specific circumstances, uh, also in, in, encompass speech acts of uh, denialism, like, uh, for instance, instigating racial discrimination, the crime of approval of crimes, insult and defamation. So it's important to keep in mind that uh, this section 130 paragraph three is embedded in like a whole net of uh, different speech crimes. But it is the only one that specifically addresses uh, denialism. So I'm going to focus in the, in the few minutes I have for my input uh, on this provision. So as you can see, uh, on the slide in the German criminal code, the object of denial is exclusively limited to acts of genocide committed during the uh, Nazi dictatorship. So it does not include the denial of any other international crimes, uh, international core crimes, other acts of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or the crime of aggression. And this brings me to say a few words about uh, the background of, of this provision. So section 133 was enacted in uh, 1994. And the provision is based uh, on the idea that uh, um, it's part of the, of the identity of current Germany as a democratic state uh, based on the rule of law. So basically the counterpart of the Nazi state uh, is its uh, historic past and the atrocities that were committed under the violent and despotic rule of uh, the Nazis and in particular the Holocaust. So this gruesome part of, of German history is in the words of, of the German constitutional court of identity forming relevance and therefore attacks on this identity by denying or, or downplaying this part of German history can be regulated by law, in particular also uh, criminal law. So this provision at the same time establishes and protects the shared collective identity uh, of the German society. Now, maybe a few words more specifically regarding the, the protected legal values and interests. So more from a specific criminal law point of view, um, this provision is uh, said to have a twofold dimension. So first, um, on the one hand, a victim related one, and on the other hand, a, a public peace related one. Um, although I must say that the, the specific uh, aims and objectives of the provision are very much uh, in dispute in, in German criminal law scholarship. So on the one hand, it is argued that the, this denialism uh, provision protects the dignity and the honor of the victims, that is the survivors, as well as the, the relatives of those who were um, murdered during the Holocaust, 
as well as the post-mortal right to uh, respect of those who were killed and whose cruel fate is denied by the perpetrators uh, of this denialism offense. And then on the other hand, uh, the aim of the provision is to protect public peace. And the argument is that the provision criminalizes conduct that uh, tries to exonerate uh, the Nazi dictatorship to um, make it seem less gruesome, less violent, and therefore makes uh, Nazi ideas and thoughts more acceptable uh, in the present. And then this has uh, the effect of disturbing the peaceful society and of poisoning the political uh, climate. And as you can see uh, on the screen, that is also why the provision uh, has the requirement that, the, uh, that it needs to be committed in public and uh, as well in a manner that disturbs um, public peace. So just to emphasize what the criminal uh, provision does not protect or at least not only protect is just like the historical truth or the historical institutional memory as such as some sort of abstract interest. But there is full agreement that any liberal criminal law uh, is not legitimate to like not a legitimate tool to do so uh, in, 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 in a liberal state. Instead, the provision uh, protects specific criminal values and interests, and that is values and interests that are also protected um, by other criminal provisions. Before I, I uh, um, hand over to my fellow co-panelists, maybe one word, um, very briefly um, on the, the object of the denial. Um, and Ricardo is going to say more about that because in various other European states, denialism provisions are much broader than the German one because uh, they not only focus on denial of acts of genocide and the Holocaust, but also include the denial of other international crimes. And there was a broad discussion in Germany whether um, to widen the scope as well of, of um, the German uh, provision, a discussion that goes back to a, a framework decision, a legal act of, of the European Union, which obligates member states to criminalize uh, certain conduct, including the denial of international crimes more generally. And a number of European states uh, did so and have broad um, denialism and provisions, but Germany argued that these forms of denial could already be captured by other criminal provisions so that there was no need to um, amend the criminal code and broaden the scope of the provision. So again, this goes back to the, to the idea um, voiced by the, by the constitutional court of the identity forming character of the specific event for today's Germany and the singularity of the, of the Holocaust. So I leave it at that with my, my brief input and um, hand the floor, floor back, back to you. Muchas gracias, Julia. A continuación tenemos a Ricardo. Thank you very much, Julia. Now we will hear from Ricardo Izquierdo with the senior officer in the national law at the International Nuremberg Academy. He's a Venezuelan lawyer admitted at the ICC. Ricardo has given legal assistance in international criminal cases and has served as legal assistant at the Member State Assembly in the Statue of Rome and as a legal advisor in Rome. Welcome, Ricardo, to this webinar. Thank you very much, Vivian. Thank you, everyone. Before starting, I would like to thank uh, the Elizabeth Caseman uh, Foundation and Global Diplomacy and the ESMA Museum for having me here. And I would like to take this opportunity to say that what 
what I will be saying in this talk is just my personal opinion from, and it's uh, what I learned at the New Navy Academy. In Latin, in Latin America and in Argentina, as it has already been stated, and at international level, I will try to speak slowly so that the interpreters can follow me. And the first thing I would like to say today is that the memory laws to, to my mind are particularly dangerous, are the least effective, and they can even be counterproductive regarding what they aim at achieving. To begin with, there is an one definition about denialism. There is a, a universally accepted definition. As uh, Julia stated before, the denialism laws uh, uh, were originated in Europe after the Second World War, and the European countries wanted to punish denialism uh, under a Nazi regime. And those behaviors can go against paramount European values and a European collective memory. That's why I talked about the German collective memory as a good protected by the criminal law, as it has been stated before. The truth is that the denialism laws phenomenon has expanded and has reached out to other latitudes as well, not only in terms of what uh, countries have uh, explored the idea of the denialism laws. Julia before was saying that we try to expand the application of denialism laws so they apply to Holocaust and other international crimes. And the truth is that there are some denialism laws in some jurisdictions that punish the Holocaust denialism and punish other issues and other institutions punish other crimes, other international crimes denialism. And there are other laws that include not only denialism per se, but also the rationale or the, or the justification of a crime or the downplaying of the crime, whether it was committed in the Holocaust or in other context. And the, the master decision 2008 mentioned by Julia, the name of the decision is 2008 master decision about the struggle against xenophobia and racism through criminal law. As you can see, it's a tool that uh, attempts to prevent or protect the legal goods and the provisions of this uh, law about denialism are quite broad and they attempt to prevent incitement to violence or hatred against racial or gender groups or other groups protected under the master decision. The truth is that as we don't have a clear denialism definition of what a minimizing denialism is or justifying international crimes, Dispositions of that kind uh, give rise to um, opposite uh, ideas. And the, the Human Rights Court says that uh, denying the Holocaust is an abuse of the rights and freedom of expression. And at the same time, it has protected the freedom of expression and it has protected the denialism that the atrocities perpetrated against Armenian population during the First World War 
uh, that is a case of genocide. And that high highlights the danger underlying the denialism laws because they can give a rise a contradictory application and uh, uh, interpretation which uh, attempts to uh, with the, the freedom of expression and we could wonder if we punish the denialism of uh, genocide why can we punish any type of uh, genocide at an international level why should we punish the um, the denialism of armenian genocide or the serious crimes committed by the soviet union and why can't we go beyond and punish the so-called the gender denialism? There are some movements in Spain that are called uh, denialists, denialists, and I'm going to quote an article to those that want to hide the structure of violence against women and that that which originates in the patriarchal society and the male chauvinism is the cornerstone. Why shouldn't we punish a colonial Eurocentric uh, denialism or even climate denialism? The question lies in where the limit to the freedom of expression lies. These laws it would clearly establish that limit. And I want to give you an example that is quite close to my homeland, my country of origin. And I'm going to read an extract and a letter that was sent by Nicolás Maduro to the King of Spain, if I'm not wrong, last year. The letter uh, goes as follows. It's just an extract. The letter is a complaint against denialism that Maduro wrote in that letter as the largest genocide in the history. And the letter goes as follows. Just like the climate change has denialists, the same applies to American genocide. They go hand in hand with racism, xenophobia, and Nazism. Europe has to recognize that its um, industrial gr growth, the booming of uh, accidental capitalism was based on a crime against humanity, against Indo-America and Africa's peoples. And the material dispossession of its wealth that started in, on October the 12th, 1492. This is a truth that can be scientifically uh, confirmed, end of quote. You might imagine what might happen to someone in Venezuela if we think about uh, Maduro's criterion, uh, and that person can be regarded as a denialist. And to, to conclude, uh, in light of this context, I think that it's important to highlight that despite good intentions that might lead to many of the denialism laws that are available, nothing guarantees that they will not be used to protect uh, a, a story instead of some historic uh, facts. And in that sense, it's a serious risk to the freedom of expression and the possibility of the free discussion and having free ideas. And that is because the freedom of expression allows that through dialogue and discussion to learn the truth, to uh, cross-check hypotheses and assess the evidence. At the end of the day, freedom of expression is not free if it doesn't include the possibility to make mistakes and that can be corrected during discussion. 
According to Deborah Lipsas, the professor who was involved in, a, in an official controversy linked to denialism and freedom of expression, she said the following. Freedom of expression means nothing except that it includes the, uh, the the possibility to defend those that need to be defended. Those that feel offended have to accept that that's the price we have to pay because we live in a free society. I'm going to stop here and perhaps later on I might address other relevant issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Next, I will give the floor to Andrea Poshak. She's a, a lawyer uh, uh, with specialization in criminal law and um, in, in the, at the University of Lanús. She was an advisor uh, on uh, freedom of expression of the OAS, and she is deputy secretary in human rights at the Secretariat of Human Rights. The floor is yours, Andrea. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, um, there was someone who could not participate. We said high season. There are, we are dealing with a lot of activities. And this discussion is uh, dealt with at the Secretariat of Human Rights, and we are always boosting uh, questions and answers. On the, on the one hand, we have seen a publication that will be showing, it is upside down, about denialism. We want to show the state of the art uh, and answers about denialism. The discussion cannot be circumscribed in criminal laws. We are talking about denialism laws as if the only alternative were the, the, the typing of denialism crimes. This discussion is open now. We don't have a criminal type that outlaws uh, denialism. We have other types, and that's why the discussion is open. But anti denialism policies and laws are not only criminal laws. The principal policies against denialism that we are boosting from the uh, Human Rights Secretariat are uh, memory policies. Are, our policies against uh, denialism. We want to have memorials and, uh, to advocate these issues and against the crimes committed. Any type of denialism or minimizing of these rights, the Human Rights Secretariat has uh, um, given discussions and we Google, Google can identify the memorials. Twitter might uh, uh, get involved when there were profiles that uh, damage the identity of uh, missing people. There, are, there is a lot of memory uh, policies for the discussion of the denialism speech. The question we can ask ourselves is what are those policies that can have to be established by law? So the, as from the state, we are um, in charge of this policy and we have to deal with these denialism speeches. We have to decide whether this type of denialism speeches deserve uh, a, a sentence. And if the state authorities uh, should not act in light of these uh, uh, denialism speeches that uh, punish uh, some uh, crimes committed under state terrorism. We 
we know that we have to um, advocate against these lies and denialism and the law and the policies have to go against these speeches without infringing the freedom of expression. But we have to know the, 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 the truth of uh, facts. What are the measures of collective uh, repair that can be established by the laws to go against these nihilism uh, speeches? What someone said, or some communicator, or politician, or journalist said is a lie because there are judicial resolutions establishing that there were crimes against humanity. There are judicial resolutions stating that the person is a murderer and that there was no excess in terms of a war. As is sometimes the case in Argentina, denial based speeches are sometimes sometimes are concealed in the theory of of war, and the state does have to publicly counteract those type of speeches. So the debate is just limited to criminal law or through the classification of those crimes. There is an open debate. Criminal law does have its virtues because of it's the way it exercises uh, legal uh, goods, but there are also limitations, limitations to freedom, related to freedom of expression, but also political limits that we can see in Argentina. The debate about denialism or about the military dictatorship in Argentina may be masked or just concealed in just four uh, walls in a criminal court, or should that debate be public? Is it? Correct? Is it useful? Can uh, criminal law have an impact to counteract denialist uh, speeches or is just uh, favoring the denialist? Can, does it have an impact to rebate denial speeches in a country like this one where the criminal system is challenged or some members of the judicial branch in Argentina are being challenged? Can it have an impact? to rebate denialist speeches when we know that the criminal classification in Argentina and in many other parts of the world are used to um, do away with some voices. There are open debates about this, but I find it interesting to highlight that anti-denialist policies and policies to rebate denialist speeches and the laws to define those uh, policies cannot be strictly limited to the punishment and the classification of those crimes. So debate is open, but from the Secretariat of Human Rights, we are actually boosting anti-denialist policies with all the political tools that we have available in this key area. We have international duties to comply with, and this is our commitment from the perspective of the Argentine state. That's my contribution to this debate. Thank you very much, Andrea. Next, we'll be hearing from our last panel member, Dr. Alejandro Alagia, member of uh, the head, head of the Department of Criminal Law of the University of Buenos Aires. He has served as a prosecutor uh, since 1993, and he serves in criminal cases against human rights and has served in that position since 2009 up to current date. The floor is yours, Alejandro. Thank you, Vivian, for your presentation. Welcome, everyone. I am thankful for this invitation to the ESMA Museum and the, the other organizers of this activity. Genocide and mass crimes, uh, mass atrocities, and problems related to those have open ground in sociology, in the new sociology. and it's quite legitimate. There are international associations already in place about the studies or related to the studies of genocide and all the problems related to those, including um, an Argentine professor that was uh, the president of this association. Yet this legitimacy 
of the sociology of genocide. There is uh, an assumed sociology of denial, and that does not, is not reflected in other areas or disciplines linked to law or a part of a sociology of violation that is criminology in both in criminology and in criminal law there is the relevance of genocide that was downgraded so there's a major denial that is being reverted not only in latin america but also in europe and in the united states on the basis of including genocide as a key issue for the study of these disciplines it's not just important to reflect on the denialism of on the side of the perpetrators, but also we should need we should reflect about deep rooted issues like the denialism of the disciplines that should hold genocide as a core for the development of uh, criminal related studies and criminal law studies. The particular problem of denialism is a complex one. It may be a key or, per, or a peripheral, a core or a peripheral problem. Andrea rightly pointed out that problems are core in terms of illegal denialism or the punishment of denialism in terms of of a country that may not support deep-rooted social and cultural processes of truth, memory, and justice, which in turn entails the prosecution and punishment in the conventional terms of crimes against humanity, and in particular, genocide. That is, a society that conducts with an active mobilization and their its own uh, judges and politically carries out a program to prosecute these events is less dependent on this type of legislation as opposed to other countries. I can remember, for instance, uh, the case of a country, for instance, like uh, the a book like that was published in the anglo saxon arena someone who was who wrote about the states of nihilism in terms of atrocities considering the paradigm of the atrocities perpetrated in south africa as well as in other regions in the world places where they, those atrocities would not be supported by a judicial review a memory review or will not be supported by social stakeholders that can execute or those policies of memory justice and truth in the courts by the judges of their own countries. So it's not so concluding about denialism, denialism being the core problem or the peripheral problem in connection with this issue, depending on the cycle or the historical cycle of each country or region. Of course, denialism has a specific features and issues because denial and forgetfulness is a key mechanism in, in our well psychical life. That's why well known, but the question is when do these mechanisms of denial and forgetfulness that are part of our common life become pathological in terms of um, mental health or serious problems? from the social and political point of view. So there is a set of vocabulary in social sciences about denial, rejection, downgrading, forgetfulness. It's a set of vocabulary that represents that denial in the face of an atrocity. Stanley Cohen himself used to reflect on denial or particularly used it from one single perspective, but we estimate it's much more encompassing. The denial of the perpetrators and the most serious problem about denial, that is the, the state of the perpetrators, 
or the accused that deny the facts Stanley Cohen used for that uh, situation the criminal in the criminology of the 50s that has to do with the techniques of a downgrading of justification of those crimes by denying that there was a victim or denying or downgrading the damage. So all the knowledge was used linked to regular uh, crime and that was uh, transferred to genocide criminology. We understand that denial is not just a problem on the side of a perpetrator, but something that is very serious and should not put aside or left aside. That is a phenomenon on the side of the victims as well. There are massive victimizations that deny the facts as they occur in the clinics of abuse, for instance, where victims may actually deny the facts. And there is a still a larger problem that's a denial, forgetfulness, and suppression, the suppression of facts, or what we could call the support of the society in general about the forgetfulness of traumatic uh, facts undergone by a society. The problem of denial does not come only from perpetrators or those who downgrade the problem, but uh, also may, be, may come from the society or from the victims. In that sense, we do not rely on this type of acts as was pointed out by Ricardo in the current right direction. No criminal law may resolve the disputes on which it uh, may have an intervention. And this is a core topic. The reason of this talk is the, the, the debate about the strain about freedom of expression and individual rights that was uh, discussed by Ricardo. And I would like to also discuss about another issue that is derived from individual freedom or the liberal argument of these rights, the right of freedom of expression. Yet there are certain hues in because it's not just a mere individual right, but it's a limitation. Argentina does have a more incapacity situation than the one that was described uh, by Julia for the case of Germany that uh, also uh, refers to crimes against humanity, war crimes in general. The project we have in Argentina is uh, an element to worsen, uh, see worse in the situation as the apology of crime, which is not just, uh, it's a still a more complex problem that is the denial and not, not understanding or not admitting a problem or an atrocity, something that is known maybe from the point of view of perception, but is uh, held as untrue. Stanley Cohen's book, that is one of the few that takes care of this, derives from the subjective states and the complexity of that in terms of law. It's not the same to restrict freedom of expression in general and restrict that freedom of expression in case of atrocities. And the same applies to other human rights related laws. There are major restrictions or a traditional Western uh, limitations of due process as the right to forgetfulness through two institutions that uh, is, that does not apply to crimes of humanity, that this is a state of limitations. Those are traditional, or this is traditional, historically traditional rights that come from the liberal revolutions, that are the right to free of uh, state of limitations and due process that were enshrined as a sovereign kind of issue, yet the problems of the 20th, 20th century logic had to reverse that situation and reflect on the fact that war crimes, for instance, or crimes against humanity cannot be subject to such limitations. Of course, it's not easy to resolve when it comes to the right to forgetfulness, traditional right to forgetfulness. There is a point when denial is not considered a crime or as a 
criminal classification that describes the punishable behavior, especially when the denial comes from the state through the, for instance, laws of forgetfulness in Argentina and Latin America, there have been many processes, really similar processes in Latin America. There are processes of uh, truth, memory, and justice, but in general, in the region, like for instance, in, uh, in Uruguay and in Brazil in particular, there are amnesty or forgetfulness laws, and those are may be considered criminal and may be considered to an alternative to this general formula I was shown by Julie as a uh, background, but, we, but which became widespread uh, all over the world. The criminal classifications may be directed to criminally uh, outlaw amnesty laws because pardons or amnesties that may lead to the impunity or by a government is not just about the denialism, but about the deprival of deprivation of truth and of persecution. It would not be a general crime, but it would be denial as a state crime. So amnesty is not just a prohibited law by international right, but might be also considered as a criminal, at the international criminal or local criminal classification. What I wanted to point out is that the main problem of denialism derives from denialism of a whole discipline, regardless of the law that may downgrade it or not, because it does not only extend to the passive subject of a crime or the perpetrator of a crime of denialism, but there are whole disciplines that actually deny the problem of genocide or, or the issue of genocide as one that challenges traditional criminal law ideas or criminology ideas. So when we start to review about the relevance of genocide, genocide is the only phenomenon in law that is uh, it's a punishment and there is an, it's a true event. Crimes against humanity, genocide, involve uh, punishment and crime at the same time. The, one of the most important denials that derive into consequences in all terms is the areas themselves as, as involved in genocide and they, that should have uh, this as a core in their studies, introducing genocide in the field of criminal law, of criminology is to actually do away with the theological quality of how a, a criminal is born and introducing the issue of uh, penalty or punishment. What's the, the, the combination of the type of, of the irrational character or challenges the irrational character? There's a huge resistance. And there is a novel review of criminology. For instance, why Morrison in, in Australia, Safaroni in Argentina consider genocide as a core that may somehow shake off uh, forgetfulness and minimize the issues that have to do with criminal legislation. This is just a scheme with general problems that I'm describing or bringing here about the relevance of the nihilism and forgetfulness in the complexity in legal terms, but also in terms of the disciplines and the states of the nihilism, the nihilism in the face of uh, crime. Now we'll start the discussion. Uh, we'll deal with the questions and answers sent through YouTube and other media. And so I will be reading the questions. The first one is for Julia. Laws against denialism were decided by the German government. Do you think this was accepted by the German Society, society has the um, German case law implemented this? Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, I think that in general, the German society accepted this law, this specific law on denialism. And um, also because, and this goes a bit back to what uh, Ricardo said, 
the, the German law, as I said, is very narrow. So it, it only, it's only regarding the denial of, of the Holocaust. And I think there is, apart from like very right-wing and anti-Semitic groups, um, a shared understanding in the German society that this is part of the German identity and that there is, um, that it is legitimate to act uh, uh, against attacks on this identity also by criminal law. Although I must say that, of course, also in Germany, there is a lot of discussion whether uh, um, criminal law is the right way to do or not, but these are very specific discussions. In general, I would say that there is agreement in the society. And yes, there are a number of cases in, in jurisprudence and case law. And what you can see is that numbers of convictions like go up and down, um, they are not very high. So in, in the beginnings, it, like until the uh, like mid, um, like until 2010, more or less, numbers were below 40, then it rose a bit. Um, also because of the internet, of course. So uh, right extremist groups are um, using the internet uh, to share their views and um, to, to, to commit uh, speech crimes. Um, and then we had the um, migration wave due to the war in Syria. And then you can see that there is, that uh, convictions are uh, rising, then they go uh, down again and then um, with the pandemic, we see again a rise in, in convictions because we had a lot of, we have and had a, quite a few cases where like um, anti-vaccination groups uh, used, um, like compared themselves to the Jews during the Holocaust. And now we have cases, court cases, and we have a few convictions in that regard, whether this constitutes denialism of the Holocaust or minimization, uh, downplayment of the Holocaust. So these are very controversial cases. There is no, until now, like we have uh, diverging court decisions and judgments, and there is no, we, the, the Supreme Court hasn't decided on these cases yet. But so you can see that whenever there is a big, um, deep, there are like, certain debates in, in uh, the German society, you can also see that these cases and the convictions for the denialism provision go up. Muchas gracias, Julia. Tengo una pregunta. Thank you very much, Julia. I have a follow-up question for you. In Germany, the denialism laws refer only to Nazism denialism, but, uh, but are there legal tools for denialism and all the damage resulting from colonialism? Um, so if I understood the correction, um, the question is, first of all, there are no, yes, it's only limited to, um, Nazi crimes. The, the specific denialism provisions um, only concern Nazi crimes. So it's, as I said, very narrow. Um, and of course, one can debate, and it would be interesting to debate whether international crimes, crimes that have been committed by the German state should maybe be included as well in a specific provision regarding the nihilism. But so far the debate um, has not been there, maybe also because the there is no phenomenon like of denying those um, crimes that have been committed um, during the, the German colonial past. And apart from uh, criminal law, there is a big debate in Germany right now at the moment, how to deal with Germany's colonial past. It's a very huge discussion right now. And there is um, agreement that these German crimes need to be addressed. And there is also this discussion about um, compensation and stuff. So there is a lot of that going on, but 
apart from the issue of denialism. Muchas gracias, Julia. Thank you very much, Julia. Now I have a question for Andrea. Could you go deeper on the uh, alternatives of uh, collective uh, repair tools apart from the criminal laws? Hello, thank you for the question. It seems that the idea is to go deeper on public policies that should be in the law. They should not be at the mercy of the incumbent authority. authority memory and truth uh, policies that are not at the uh, mercy of authorities, laws that establish the um, imperative nature of uh, go against denialism speeches and to use the mass media and the social media to discredit and to establish a collective replica law about uh, denialism speeches. And this should not be at, mer at mercy of uh, incumbent authorities. In Argentina, there have been a strong setbacks regarding the memory and justice phenomena. And they should, this policy should not be limited to the criminal policy. It is an alternative. The criminal law is an option. But the key is to think about all other policies that might enrich the discussion. In Argentina, we have gone so far with justice and memory, uh, with social endorsement and the support given by the human rights movement. How can we endorse this social uh, support for memory, justice and truth policy without these policies being uh, circumscribed to the criminal law. Thank you, Andrea. Next, I would like to share a comment um, written in the YouTube chat. And those of you who would like to say something about that are welcome to do so. The comment goes like this. I think that uh, in Alison should be criminalize when the perpetrator is a public officer or people that are politically exposed and those that uh, deal with communication, for example, journalists. For the other people, I think the best, uh, the best is uh, to work on policy and memory policies. Those who would like to make a remark, you have the floor. The first uh, opinion I can give is that uh, uh, expressions uh, given by politically exposed people are those that uh, uh, speak uh, in a public discussion. It is all these expressions that uh, go in conflict with the freedom of expression when we try to criminalize that. We have moved forward with the criminalization of public uh, critic and also in case of insults, but they involve public interest. It's undeniable that the discussion on crimes against uh, humanity is an issue of public concern. I'm not saying that uh, um, denialism criminal law it goes against the freedom of expression. But I don't think the limit has to be laid somewhere. I think it's more interesting to publicly change uh, the standpoint of our, an Argentine representative that argues that there was no genocide in Argentina. The discussion is enriched when we uh, go and criminalize someone who has political uh, responsibility. And the way to do so is not to limit the issue to the criminal law. We have to have more comprehensive anti denialism policies that uh, aim at finding out the truth and that the society has to know that someone is lying. Not only should we have a state uh, against 
a criminal law perpetrator, but we should say that someone is a liar. And that should be um, addressed. Thank you very much, Andrea. Anybody else would like to say something? Yes. I think that Andrea's comment is clear. Sometimes I cannot hear very well. Um, her, her comments are really viable. And undoubtedly, there are many public policies that may be applied for the sake of protecting collective memory for the events occurred in the country. At the end of the day, the devil lies in the, de in the details. And we could think that we could restrict the punishment of denialism to certain public figures. And that, uh, we can think that that could help. I think it's a possibility to be considered that there can be some uh, restrictions. We should think that the risk of enforcing or, in, or construing a law of that type that can emerge in certain societies where there exist totalitarianism systems. Among the YouTube comments, I saw some reference being made to the U Ukraine uh, conflict. And a couple of weeks ago, if I'm not wrong, there were some interviews where Russian authorities had approved to imprison uh, those that send messages against uh, peace and public tranquility. So they were referring to how people uh, grade the conflict. The Russian authorities say that they have a special involvement in this conflict when there is no doubt that there is an attack on human rights. And the same applies to other legal instruments. And I would like to give an example uh, that is close to me. In Venezuela, my, uh, there has been uh, a talk about this, and, and it was ab ad 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 and the several assemblies in Venezuela pass a constitutional law against hatred for uh, uh, peaceful living together. And this was against the, the events in 2017 and 2014 that are under investigation by the International Supreme Court. And that law was passed by, was majority, by majority, and the text of the law addresses the right to peace, the right to love, to democracy, to living together, and it establishes obligations for the for the mass media and and responsibilities regarding uh, social media messages. And they are under the, um, the scope of love and living together and to apply public policies for the sake of these purposes. It's a law for uh, political persecution. The state uh, talks about events that have already taken place and the law and their tolerance and 
attempts to prevent uh, the adoption of a, a different policy. So we have to consider public policies that will allow the protection of certain collective values. But as I said before, the devil lies in the details. Thank you very much, Ricardo. There are a lot of questions and remarks. So one of the latest remarks uh, is about a reflection between denialism and its legal issue regarding the social media. Any of the panelists who would like to make a reflection uh, is welcome to do so. Well, I could answer that query. Even when in our country and in general in any criminal code uh, uh, punishes the crime apology or the criminal or a convict, that's why I pointed out that the laws that punish denialism are a specific or aggravated form of a criminal type, classical criminal type. So the crime apology law could be applied. Uh, there have been large monopoly, monopolies over the latest years in communication, so they have criminal and civil liabilities in terms of communication. That is from the legal point of view, and I don't think it's the most important. The most important thing is, as Julia has already stated, the Holocaust case, or uh, historic uh, trials in international crimes. There were accusations and convictions against uh, journalists in Nuremberg trials on the Rwanda trials. Uh, they were convicted for their participation in these crimes. And as a preliminary act to this genocide, the genocide is a social phenomenon compressed in different stages. One of the stages is a creation of the subversive enemy to destroy the enemies. And that requires the involvement of uh, certain urgencies and to create a community uh, and discuss the idea of groups of Arabs and black people, mentally ill people that can be discriminated and the role that the social media have played to create these uh, negative roles and favor genocide, the idea was to commit atrocities before. Now, there cannot be uh, any atrocity committed. There should be consensus, and that implies elements of denialism, and so the mass social media intervene. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Now we we'll go ahead with the discussion and I would like to ask Julia a question. The question is whether there is some evidence about the convictions in Germany, if that there has been a change of mindset in these people because of the convictions. Mm, that's a good question. No, well, I think one has to distinguish um, between, I think, two groups of, of people who commit those crimes, um, the crime of, of denialism and, and the specific conduct that is um, included. So, so first, and that was why we had this law in the first place, um, as I said, it, it was like, like clear denialism or approval 
by right extremist groups and we still have that and it's a lot of like these days also a lot of like, younger people um and i mean there is no no there is no no change in their minds obviously um and they also might use these laws as some sort of like like they play themselves as mar mar martyrs and, and like um, going against the state that is um, violating the freedom of expression. So um, they also use it as provocation, obviously. So no, there has been no change in, in their minds. And then we have another group of people that is, um, as I said before, also emerging um, or was clear, is clearly visible when it comes to those um, demonstrations against um, the, the measures against the corona pandemic. So it's, um, I would, I don't want to call them like, like normal people, they, they, but they are not right wing extremists, but they, um, they, they see themselves and they see state measures and they compare themselves as Jews that were prosecuted during the Holocaust. And I'm not sure whether maybe, um, maybe um, some cases against th this group of people might not have a certain kind of impact, um, but I'm not sure. There is not enough evidence because it's very new and there is not, an, not enough of, of um, academic uh, discussion and, and criminological um, reports on that. So that would be interesting, interesting to learn. But maybe, maybe it's also more um, to uh, um, to protect the the collective view against these um, minority views. I would say. Thank you very much, Julia. I have one last question and then we will be wrapping up the, this webinar. This question is for the member of the panel who would like to answer it. This would be a law against hatred speeches, an option to prohibit the crimes against humanity. Perhaps, Ricardo, would you like to take this question? Yes, I thought Andrea wanted to say something. Yes, of course, I think that the, the laws that criminalize or penalize hatred and denialism speeches are an option. To, to prevent them, of course, they are an alternative. Or I attempted to discuss whether it was the only or the best option. It's not the same to talk about hatred speeches and to talk about denialism speeches. Hatred speeches encourage hatred and violence. And according to this different types, they can have an impact on the behavior and they can have the capacity to change people's behavior and encourage hatred and violence. Another thing is the criminal type of denialism that attempts to penalize or punish those that deny a genocide or a crime against humanity. But if we are talking about options, yes, they are definitely options. The question is whether it is, it is the only option or the best option to prevent the recurrence of these facts. We have vast experience in memory, truth and justice policies and the attempt at never again to avoid or to prevent the atrocities we were victims of. So the question is, the best 
alternative to keep on working on this never again policy. Thank you, Andrea. Did Ricardo, did you want to say something? I will try to express it in a nutshell. Regarding the question asked to Julia before, it's a very important question. Because in a social state, the criminal law, the criminal intervention has to prove useful. The criminal law intervention has to be useful. And it's not quite clear at present, I believe, that the laws that punish denialism have some sort of uh, impact on prevention, on changing people's attitudes among deni denialists, and to strengthen the collective memory of society. That is a critical discussion when it comes to, to consider and decide whether a denialism law is useful, a criminal law, I'm talking about a criminal law in any society involved. And regarding the hatred speech, we are not talking about details. There is no, as far as I'm concerned, there is no definition about what is meant by a hatred speech. And I think it's quite complex to know or to clearly determine when one remark or someone, somebody's idea is hatred motivated and it attempts to encourage hatred against a, a group. The hatred speech uh, limits the freedom of expression. Another thing is when you uh, incite violence. Alejandro was referring to major cases in international criminal law that have to do with the mass media that encourage uh, crimes to be perpetrated against specific groups. And that's another topic to discuss. But if it, this encourages hatred or not, it's a more delicate type of conversation. First, we should define it, and then we should see who decides when a specific remark encourages hatred or is capable of encouraging hatred, that is a very key question, which unfortunately leads to the restriction of freedom of expression or inclusion. And it clearly depends on, who, on the decision makers. That is to say, if a specific opinion is regarded as uh, encouraging hatred. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Well, uh, now I want to thank the four uh, members of the panel, Julia Genau, Ricardo Izquierda, Andrea Pozak, and Alejandro Alagia, for having shared their views for this discussion. And I want to thank all the people that have participated through the YouTube channel and have sent their comments and questions. Um, perhaps we haven't been able to answer all questions and deal with all remarks, but I think it has been a very enriching discussion. I'm going to give the floor to Salome for her to close this meeting. Thank you. Well, we want to once again thank, thank all the members of this panel who participate in the discussion. I want to thank the organizations present in this discussion and, and the moderator and interpreters who have been working uh, during this uh, activity so that uh, the, the so that uh, the opinions could be translated into Spanish and English. I want to thank the Casman Foundation, the Memory uh, and Sight Museum, and uh, invite you to join the next activities that we'll be organizing. 
we will be addressing the issue of genocide in April, and in May we'll be talking about memory sites and world heritage. Thank you very much for uh, for for your presence.